Greenland's weather can be summed up in four words, cold, variable, windy, and foggy. Mean summer temperatures are around five degrees Celsius. And while that might not sound cold, remember this is the temperature in the warmest months of the year. In addition, strong dry winds frequently blow down from Greenland's ice cap, bringing drift ice from the north and causing dense fogs. In fact, these fogs can be so bad that travel ceases altogether. It was here that for nearly 500 years between 984 CE and the 1400s, that European civilization's most remote outposts lay, where Scandinavians, or as we better know them today, Vikings, 1,500 miles from their home in Norway, built a cathedral and churches, wrote in Latin and Old Norse, wielded iron tools, herded farm animals, animals, followed the latest European fashions in clothing, and finally, vanished. When you look at this picture of the church at Valsi, it appears strikingly similar to churches one may see while on vacation elsewhere in Europe, meaning whichever society built this church knew enough to recreate some semblance of a European community 1,500 miles from Europe and maintain that community for centuries, but didn't know enough to maintain it for any longer. In other words, they didn't know enough to prevent their own collapse. Compounding this mystery, the Vikings shared Greenland with another people, the Inuit. And whereas the Vikings disappeared, the Inuit survived, proving that survival in Greenland, though challenging, was not impossible. Of course, that's assuming that your community isn't riddled with dysfunctional political and cultural practices. When we talk about dysfunctional political and cultural practices in this video, we're going to speak about several things. Farming, hunting and fishing, society, and self-image. Let's begin by learning about dysfunctional practices as they pertain to farming. In keeping with their European and specifically Norwegian roots, Viking settlers in Greenland started with aspirations based on the mix of livestock maintained by prosperous Norwegian chiefs. Lots of cows and pigs, fewer sheep and still fewer goats, plus horses, ducks, and geese. In their farming practices, regardless of the different climate, they sought to farm in the way they would have back in Norway. Quickly, it became clear that this mix of livestock was not well suited to the colder conditions of Greenland, as the ducks and geese died off almost immediately. Pigs, too, proved unsuitable for the environment, as they were terribly destructive and unprofitable in lightly wooded Greenland, where they rooted up all the fragile vegetation and soil. Within a short time, they were reduced to low numbers, and eventually, they too were eliminated. Cows required a great deal of effort, as they could find grass in pastures only during the three snow-free months. For the rest of the year, they had to be kept indoors in barns and fed hay. As it is, sheep and goats were better suited to the cold climate than were the cattle. Most importantly, they can dig through the snow to graze and could be kept outside during the winter months. Thus, while Vikings arrived in Greenland with a preference for cows over sheep and goats, the suitability of those animals under Greenland conditions made it so that Viking settlers were forced to amend and adjust their preferences. Of course, seeing as how we're talking about decline and a society's unwillingness to adapt, this is something they chose not to do. During the winter, cows remained all the time in their stalls, where their dung that they dropped accumulated as a rising tide around them until the spring when the sea of dung was shoveled outside. During the winter, cows were fed hay, but because its quantities weren't sufficient, it had to be supplemented with seaweed which the cows evidently didn't like. They didn't like it to the point that farmers had to live in the barns with the cows and their piles of dung all winter so that they could force feed the cows the seaweed-enriched hay. It took several tons of hay to maintain a cow throughout the average Greenland winter. Hence, the main occupation of most Vikings during the late summer had to be cutting, drying, and storing hay. These hay quantities accumulated were critical because they determined how many animals could be fed throughout winter, but that depended on the duration of that winter, which could not be predicted perfectly in advance. Hence, each September, the Vikings had to make the agonizing decision of how many of their precious livestock, livestock to cull, 
basing that decision on the amount of hay available and on their guess as to the length of the coming winter. If they kill too many animals in September, they would end up in May with uneaten hay and they'd kick themselves for not having gambled. Conversely, if they kill too few animals in September, they might find themselves running out of hay before May and risk the whole herd starving. Needless to say, the Vikings would have been better off had they simply abandoned their cows and raised sheep and goats. But cows were too prized as status symbols to be eliminated entirely. The next area we will look at in terms of dysfunctional political and cultural practices is hunting and fishing. Livestock and dairy products alone could not produce enough food for the inhabitants of Greenland, and gardening was of little use given the land and short growing season. As such, the other components of the Viking diet was caribou and seals. In some cases, seal meat made up 80% of a family's diet. Logically, it would make sense then that surrounded by water, there would be a robust and active fishing culture that much of their resources would be devoted to. As it is, though, the Vikings developed a taboo against eating fish, meaning that while fish were readily available to them, their societal practices told them and their descendants to not eat fish. Maybe not the most practical decision to make when you're fighting for survival and you live on an island. The next area we'll look at in terms of dysfunctional political and cultural practices is society. There were roughly 5,000 people living on 250 farms with an average of 20 people per farm. Belonging to a farm was absolutely essential to survival. Every piece of the few useful patches of land was owned either by an individual farm or communally by a group of farms. As a result, one could never go at it on their own as, they simply, me, as there simply wasn't enough to go around. The result was a tightly controlled society in which the few chiefs of the richest farms could prevent anyone else from doing something that seemed to threaten their interests, including experimenting with innovations that could have improved farming practices, but did not promise to help the chiefs maintain their power. Power in Greenland society was concentrated at the top in the hands of the chiefs. They owned most of the land, owned the boats, and controlled trade with Europe. They sought to import those goods that brought the most prestige to their households. There would have been plenty of imports that would have improved the conditions of the Vikings as a whole, such as iron. But such things would have threatened the chief's power, prestige, and narrow interests. The next area we'll look at in terms of dysfunctional political and cultural practices is self-image. Greenland Vikings identified as Christian and European, two, identity, two identities that may help explain why the Greenlanders acted in ways that we today with the benefit of hindsight, would say are maladaptive and ultimately costly. In Greenland, there was one cathedral, 13 large churches, many smaller churches, and a monastery and nunnery. St. Nicholas Cathedral, for example, measured 105 feet long and 53 feet wide with a bell tower 83 feet high. St. Nichols and other light churches must have consumed horrifyingly large amounts of scarce timber to support their walls and roofs. Expensive church implements like bronze bells and communion wine competed for not only money, but scarce cargo space on arriving trading ships from Europe. Church-associated lands ultimately came to comprise much of the best land in Greenland, including much of the arable farmland. We have to wonder if the Greenlanders would have been better off had they imported fewer bronze bells and more iron with which to make tools. As for their Europeanness, Greenlanders imported European bronze candlesticks, glass buttons, and gold rings. They followed and adopted changing European customs and fashions in detail. Even their hairbrushes had to follow suit, as around 1200 CE, in spite of their struggling to survive on a distant European outpost, they traded in one-sided brushes for the much more fashionable two-sided brush, which was popular on continental Europe. The 10 minutes are about to run out, so I'm going to pause there just for a second, and then we'll come back and watch part two.